we're excited to bring in our good friend, Elisa Z. She's a veteran broadcaster, but Elisa, uh, you, I love what you're doing um, for your father, but let's just kind of start at the beginning. Spex Howard, which uh, for years has been located there in Southfield, is going through somewhat of a trans transition, Yes, just like all of us in the middle of a pandemic, but also journalism in general is changing as well. Absolutely. You and I know that firsthand. And I loved how you were able to just go with the flow. Welcome back to live TV, right? That's how it works. I also want to say you got me, first of all, thank you for having me, but you've also got me thinking about where my library card is. I'm sure it exists somewhere, somewhere <laughs> with a stack of my kids' library cards. But that also brings up how things are changing, right? People go to the library differently. We are in a whole other world when it comes to radio television, graphic design, everything old is new again, and we change with the times, right? So, and I think about um, people such as your father, where the industry was, where they started. I mean, even for us, uh, I remember getting into TV and we still had like the three quarter deck, yep. you know, and then you went to beta and then you went to DVC Pro. Now it's on a chip. And so trying to even find the equipment to play some of these old tapes, can yes. be a challenge, but uh, with that too, is Specs Howard, is it going away or it's not going away? What is the status? Well, first of all, I'll tell you the person Specs Howard, we hope doesn't go away anytime soon. There, yes, Virginia, there is a Specs Howard, 95 years old. That is my father. He's been Specs Howard for many, 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 many years. The school- So, Elisa, though, I will yes. say uh, at first, I thought it was just the name. I didn't realize that's a lot the of name do. your dad went by, but it was his on-air name. Yes, his real name is Jerry Liebman. Would you go to the Jerry Liebman School of Broadcasting? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> so how did he come up with rock and roll jock? Yeah. Right. How did he come up with Specs Howard? <laughs> Well, it was a couple of the executives. He was working in Cleveland, and I can't remember if it was an NBC station at that point or Westinghouse, but they were switching to rock and roll. And they said to everybody, all right, you got to get new names, new names. And he, they said, all right, go home and think about it. He didn't even get a chance to go home, talk to my mother, ask about it at all. The executives, rumor has it, after a several martini lunch, called him in and said, Jerry Lieberman, we got your name. And he said, what is it? And they told him it's Specs Howard. They said, what do you think? He said, do I have a choice? They said, no. I said that I love it. So he used to wear very thick glasses back in the day before these progressive bifocal things. That's where they got specs. They opened the phone book, plunked their finger down. I don't know if people watching remember phone books, but there used to be a thing called phone books. And they got Howard out of the phone book. And there he was, specs Howard and still remains. That is such a fascinating story. Don't you love it? The stories behind how we got our on-air names. Um, but he took his career in broadcasting and then he built the school. Yes. And think about the lives he's touched through the years. He's so humble that he, he kind of turns his head whenever I comment on that. But a day doesn't go by, Ronnie, that I don't run into somebody who says, please send my love to your father because not only did he help guide me in a career, but he changed my life. He changed the entire direction of my life because of that. I met my wife. I met my husband. My, I, I was no longer living on the streets. The changes people have gone through, because you know how it is when you have something to focus on that's positive that you really want to dedicate your life to. That's a change that that is priceless. It really is. You know, what's been so valuable about the school as well is it's been so hands-on. We know people that went to a traditional four-year college and you get out with that degree and it still did not teach you or prepare you for the actual industry. And so Specs Howard has been so instrumental and in really getting individuals and people ready for the business in an honest and true aspect so they could walk out of there and walk into a newsroom. And um, how is your dad taking this news that Specs Howard is going to be transitioning into a new phase? 
as with anything, he rolls with the punches. He looks ahead to what's important to the students, what will be the best way to serve the community and move into the next decade, the next century. And he embraces that change. That's how the business stayed in play for all these years, since 1970, January 14th, my little brother's birthday got opened on his birthday, not anybody else's, but that's okay. It's how it goes, right? So uh, what is actually gonna happen to the program? The program is staying, where yes. is it going? Do you do you have answers to that yet? And what happens I to the do. students that are enrolled? Your, your timing is perfect because it just went public yesterday. So yay, I'm allowed to actually say it out loud. Students who are currently enrolled in the programs at the Spex Howard School will be transitioning into that same program, completing with the same teachers at Lawrence Technological University. They will be absorbing the program and it will be Spex Howard at LTU. Wow, what a great university to team yeah. up with. Yes, and that helps to ensure it, what's important to me, What it helps to ensure the students will be well taken care of and my father's legacy remains safe and strong and positive. And, and so with that too, um, Elisa Z with us here on the Megacast. Uh, Elisa, can we talk about your dad and um, the project that you're taking on and is uh, you're trying to get off the ground to try to honor him, but also remember everything that he's done for uh, you know the community really yes how do you do that in 30 minutes or 60 minutes or less but we're going to do it with a documentary called this is where i started how Spex Howard changed the landscape of broadcast media and this is a project ronnie i have wanted to do for years and I got the production team together. My business partner is Mark Lee. We've formed an LLC. We're Lee Z LLC. And one, it's our names. He's Mark Lee. I'm Elisa Z. But that's also one of the nicknames my dad calls me because I'm Lee Z or Lizo sometimes. So I just loved it the way it flowed. And we have partnered with the production teams at MCCI, Mort Crim Communications, to do our production for this film that we've already started. We're raising money to complete it, but we have started production of This Is Where I Started, How Specs Howard Changed the Landscape of Broadcast Media. So deal. I know you're in the beginning stages, but uh, what, what, like, if you, have you tried to t started piecing together the storyline in your head? Uh, who Absolutely. are you going to be interviewing? Well, Specs, for, for example, Specs Howard, certainly. We were so lucky with the timing before the pandemic really exploded here in the area. Mark Lane with MCCI came to the school and spent hours with Specs, interviewing him, asking him story about stories, just getting so much great footage, because that will be a large piece of this, is hearing it from Specs's own mouth. It is, this is where I started. And then the pandemic hit, and here we are more than a year later. So thank goodness we were able to get that done. Additionally, we will be talking to high profile grads in the industry, people whose lives are changed because of Specs Howard. And that includes not just people working on the air or people who are graduates of the school, but industry leaders because they continue to hire Specs Howard grads. So it's a pretty vast and broad project that we'll have to hone down, you know how editing rolls, right? We'll have 87,000 hours of footage to put into a documentary, but the stories that are already coming out are fantastic. That is going to be the biggest challenge. Yes, yes, we're picking and choosing. It's so hard, which is why I'm really glad to have such a terrific team with Mark Lee, Mark Lane, Jeanette smith Catilla, all the folks, and Jim McFarlane is, really helping a lot we'll talk about Jim in a minute if you'd like but all of these people are intimately involved in not just this project but in the industry so they know everything I want to do with this project comes from the heart and they can be my touchstone when I say oh but this is great it makes me cry and they'll go um, okay Z it's a great story but doesn't quite fit here and they know I'm okay with that so I'm grateful to them for their honesty <laughs> the gentle honesty <laughs> 
Right. It is such a passion a project, and I'm sure your father is so proud uh, to have you involved in this. And Elisa, can I ask you, what was it like growing up with your dad? It was interesting. When I was a kid, it was just, you know, that's just who dad is. Doesn't everybody go see the Beatles when they're six? Doesn't everybody stand backstage for a Dave Clark Five concert? So for me, it was just what dad did. And every now and then I'd go to work with him like other kids go to work with their dads. When I was 13 years old, going to Thompson Junior High School in Southfield, Robert Feldman took a whole bunch of us to see a Steppenwolf concert for his bar mitzvah. And I remember at the time thinking, wow, it's my first concert, even though I grew up going to every concert that came to town. So it just it, it was just what dad did. As I got older and fell in love with the business, it was, wow, I have a whole new respect for what my father has done for a living. And we, we sort of developed a mutual admiration society because as he watched me grow in the business, he also felt, took, took such pride in what I was doing. So yeah, I'm, I've always been proud of my dad. What are his thoughts on where the industry is today? He tries to understand it. Let's start with that. <laughs> <laughs> so do we. Uh, oh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Remember, he's 95 years old. However, I will say my mom at 90, my dad at 95, they both have MacBooks and they know how to use them. And they both have iPhones. My mom's is a four, but that's okay. They, <laughs> they know how to use them. But one of the things about my folks is that they've always understood if you want to stay relevant, you need to learn what's around you and be able to look forward to what is coming next. So my dad remembers when FM radio came to town and the late Dick Kernan tells the story of, of a boss saying it's, it's never, actually it's my dad's story, that FM's never going to stay around. Somebody said it's never going to last because people have to remember math with decimal points. Kids will never remember FM. That person did not last very long in the business, obviously. But someone like my dad would say, no, this is what's next. This is what's new. So now he stays re relevant by watching the students, watching his kids, his grandkids, and his great-grandkids get involved in technology. And he asks the questions, and he really listens for the answers. And he gets it to whatever extent a layperson can understand the latest Shure microphone, he gets it. So he's in awe, though. He really is in awe of what's going on. It, it, technology is a changing so rapidly, and just how we get our information has changed uh, as yeah. well. And it, it really is fascinating. I think uh, just in the past 10 years, how much the industry has changed, it's going to be fascinating to see where it goes in the next 10 years yes. as well. And um, if I can ask you, how much money are you guys hoping to raise to be able to complete this project? The whole project is a huge undertaking, about 75 to $100,000. What we're doing first is setting small goals, 2,500, which we've already surpassed our first goal. The next goal will be to hit the $5,000 mark for June, because at that point we have a basis to number one, start with more of the editing of the footage we have already done that they have kindly done on spec for us, not on specs, but on spec, <laughs> which is confusing. And then we may be looking to potentially hire a grant writer to go after some of the larger funding. We're talking to businesses, corporations, and larger enterprises. If somebody wants to underwrite a large portion of the project, they will become executive producers and be in all of the social media, all of the advertising, all of the trailers, and everything like that. Initially, though, you, you got to eat the elephant one bite at a time, right? And as my old softball coach used to say, a, a hit's as good as a run. So bit by bit by bit from the public, we are hoping by the end of June to have at least $5,000 in the coffer in our Indiegogo campaign. So with that, uh, Elisa, we know that you have uh, a vast experience in broadcasting, but is this your first project trying to raise this much money and, and doing a project of this scope and this scale? 
It is. I'm an audio girl. Now I'm on a video project and oh my goodness, what am I doing? Which is why, as my dad always says, surround yourself with the right people and let them do what you've hired them to do. And that is why I'm working with Mark Lee and Mark Lane and Jim McFarlane and Jeanette smith Catillo because they know what they're doing in that regard. Jim McFarlane, for example, uh, some people who've been around for more than a minute or two remember him as one of the music writers here in town. He often writes for our magazine, and he's really helping me a lot. Jim and I have been talking together about this project for a lot of years. He has such a great background in this market and has known me for years that he's helping also to keep me grounded and be a good touchstone and help me with some of the writing and such. So every person involved in the project is top drawer in what they do. My job is to get out of their way and let them do that. So when do you guys hope to have uh, the film finished? Boy, oh boy, oh boy. This may sound a little sad, but sooner rather than later, because my dad's 95. Mm. And I have no reason to think he's leaving anytime soon, but I sure want him to be around at that big premiere. So Paul Glantz, if you're watching and listening, we'd love to have you as a major underwriter and we'll we'll show it at one of your theaters. How's that sound? Right. That was We've had him on the show money. a couple of times though. Yeah. So you know, and, but but with that as well, too, it's like you said, you know, you're having to take on these different components. Uh, as well, and trying to fit your life story, your dad's life story, into a film will be challenging, but what a journey it's going to be for you to be able to live these moments or relive them, but also to yes. hear them through his eyes, maybe new stories you didn't know. I'm amazed that at my age, I'm in my 60s, so you'd think I would have heard every story my dad has to tell. No. I'm still learning new ones about the man who wouldn't call him Spex Howard. The guy was was on the air right before him, and he would introduce him as Jerry Liebman every day. Once management said, now you're Spex Howard, this gentleman said, Jerry, you gave away your soul. You shouldn't do that. Never again introduced him as by his name. It was something like, and now... Here's the friendly neighbor or something like that. These are stories I'm getting to learn about the industry and about my father through the years. You know, it really is uh, such a blessing for you to be able to get to hear his story and yes. to relive his stories as well. But it's also a good reminder for all of us that we should take the time to sit down with our relatives, with our parents and our grandparents because they all have these life stories and you know we take them from granted and we live around them but we never hear these intimate details of their lives and learn from their attitudes and their inspiration i spoke recently with gordy howe's granddaughter megan who's a wonderful woman and she said she said you know what our, i think my grandpa and your dad were cut from very similar cloths which they were and she said she just loved, even when Gordy's memory was going, just sitting by his bedside and soaking up the inspiration. And from my father, I'm so grateful I still get the stories. But from both my parents, I still get to soak up that inspiration every single day. And if he can go from broadcasting to starting a school that gives you that uh, inspiration and that passion to yes. make sure this uh, project finally gets off the ground and gets mm -hmm. finished because as you said, you've been thinking about doing it for all of these Every years. Time. And thank you for helping to make it happen, Ronnie. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to talk about it. This is a huge, huge help. Well, we, uh, we're excited to have you, but we're excited to see it as well. Can't wait for the premiere. Can I ask you one last question about the students that were enrolled um, as it goes over to Lawrence Tech? Do they have to re-enroll in Lawrence Tech? How is that going to work? No, it will be seamless. For current students, all they have to do is drive a mile in another direction. Uh, and, and so it will be nice and easy. Lawrence Tech has been wonderful opening their arms and saying, come on over here, Spex Howard students. You'll even have your same teachers working as adjunct over here. So it will be totally seamless, Spex Howard at LTU. Uh, look at that. See how things come together? Uh, yes. Because I know I can imagine that it's been an extremely stressful time for you and your family uh, wondering what was going to happen with the school. 
Um, yeah. But it's landing right down the road and how lucky for these students uh, to be able to also be a part of the Lawrence Tech family as well. And I'm honored that my father's name will live on there. Oh, that is so great. I can't wait to meet him in person. I've never met him. Well, come on over. <laughs> <laughs> come over there. <laughs> well, Elisa, it's been so great uh, talking to you again. How can people donate if they want to? Indiegogo, which is spelled I-N-D-I-E-G-O-G-O. -O. So if you go to the Indiegogo website and search, this is where I started. That's where our campaign is, or you can friend us on Facebook. This is where I started. And we'll welcome you in with open arms and any contribution of any size is more than welcome. Thank you so much in advance. Right, and like we said, we know so many people are struggling in the middle of the pandemic, but even if it's a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, <laughs> it all adds up. And uh, so let's support this project. But uh, Elisa Z with us here on the Megacast again, Spex Howard, uh, be a part to make this film a reality. We so appreciate your time and we wish you uh, the best of luck. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all for having me. I really appreciate it. It's always great to see you, Ronnie.